The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This podcast is brought to you by Challenger, who believe in providing customers with financial security for a better retirement. Challenger's lifetime annuities provide different payment solutions to suit your client's financial circumstances and needs. For income certainty, they can choose CPI indexed or fixed payments. Alternatively, they can choose to have payments linked to changes in the RBA cash rate or investment markets. Challenger can provide your clients with a monthly income for life so they can enjoy today knowing they'll always have income in the future. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today uh, I'm pumped to be here with fellow bearded man. Not that you guys can uh, have the pleasure of seeing this, but uh, the one and only Nathan Fradley. Uh, Nathan is a senior advisor at Tribeca Financial. He's also director at Ethos Australia, which is an ESG portfolio construction platform. And he's actually the founding chair of the XY Advisor Ethics Committee. So uh, I'm keen to, to pick Nathan's brain about, you know, advice stuff, but also the ESG piece. Nathan, thanks for joining us, mate. Great to be back again. Thanks, Ben. Mate, I thought a good place to start is really just talking a bit about your um, talking through, and I know you shared a bit of this before, but like your advisor story and journey which i think is a pretty interesting one yeah so um we'll go go start from the start uh 21 years old uh budding young nathan got an advice job as a wild card hire at nab in the financial planning team there um worked there for a few years and i think met some really great people that i'm still friends with now um well, and prior to that did i think i did a couple of months at a, another firm which wps financial group which i think a lot of people who listen to the xy podcast either know about or probably worked for for at least a week and uh <laughs> then um yeah made my way through that and left after becoming senior after about four and a half years started lime financial planning which i think most people would know me from and ran that for the last six or seven years and did the slog through that and learned an enormous amount I think I did about 20 years of financial planning career in that six, seven year period. Yep. And then uh, in December of last year, I uh, decided that I, for what I was looking for and, and what the kind of work I wanted to do and what gave me most fulfillment, I decided to uh, to merge into Tribeca um, in Hawthorne in Melbourne. And so that's pretty interesting. So you're running a business for like six, almost seven years Um and then join Tribeca, which is a you know fairly established, much bigger um, business. How did that all come about? What sort of drove it, and how did you actually tackle that? I think the about twelve to eighteen months prior to that, I was really soul searching as to what do I enjoy most of all. And fundamentally, my my favorite thing at advice is actually getting brand new people who have never had advice excited about changing their lives and bringing them in. Um, so it might be called a hunter role or anything like that that people attach it to but I love that part I love people who have not had exposure to advice bringing them into the world and showing them how powerful it is the the pure value of it and then delivering on that but as a self-employed financial advisor my time was spent less and less on doing that and more and more on everything else Um, and you know with COVID and all those sorts of things and there were so many clients coming in and and I, I really, I suppose, started investigating what my options were. And I spoke to a lot of people. I explored a few different um, options for different forms of acquisition and merger. And and then through a chat with um, Craig Bigelow, um, one day he said, oh, you should meet with Ryan. And so Ryan and I went for a walk um, in the you know yards, backyard of Q, um, 
down through one of the parks there for about two and a half hours, hit it off like a house on fire. And yeah, got along really, really well. We're very aligned. You know, I think for me, um, the advice I've done for a very long time is very strategic. And obviously with ethical investments, that's the product piece, but uh, the advice part, I do a lot of aged care work. I do a lot of Centrelink work. I do a lot of strategic work and that's the core of what Trebekah did. So I think the alignment was there. And then they had this entire part of their business around coaching and mentoring. Um, you know, the the one and only Brad Fox, um, ex CEO of of um, AFA, there yeah, he's got an yeah he's got an enormous amount of um, of knowledge in that space. And and so even been the last six months being working with them, I've learned a lot about structuring those sorts of things. But for me, it was about getting back to being an advisor, and not having to wear the eight different coats in a given week. Mm, totally. I know for us, we've been hiring um, for senior advisor for a couple of senior advisor roles for um, for a while. And increasingly, I'm sort of talking to people that have come from being business owners where they're um, they're looking for, yeah, like, like you say, love talking to clients, love being at that pointy end of the spear, but they need drag down in, you know, how to structure an email signature and dealing with the, um, you know, compliance admin and, you know, all of these things that do consume a huge amount of time and with the increased standards, which I think, you know, we're just having, having a bit of a chat offline that I think they have helped to push along advice to closer to where it needs to be. Um, yeah, it, it is increasingly important, but increasingly time consuming. And uh, a lot of people, it's like, I want to be an advisor. And for me, I love having those conversations. I haven't managed to find someone that's exactly the right fit for that particular hire um, as yet. But uh, I love that. And then, you know, that people understand as well for me and having these, this conversation, it's like, they understand the dynamics of a business. They understand there are all these moving parts. They tend to be a little bit more commercially minded because you're forced into that, obviously, as a business owner, which I think, you know, everyone can benefit from being a bit more like that. Not to say that you have to be, you know, chasing every dollar and, um, you know, that's the only consideration, but it is a consideration uh, inside a business. So um, I think that I love, yeah, that uh, possibility. And I think we'll probably see more of that as smaller companies with that don't have the same resources that, that it's just hard that you, you end up wearing all of the hats and you're going to wear a lot of hats anyway, but you end up wearing so many that, um, yeah, can can be overwhelming and massively you're like, I love talking to people, but I just don't want to do all this other stuff. So uh, and you, I and think you look at skill sets, right? Like, like I'm really good with people. Um, mm. I'm quite technical as well, but I'm I am not a systems process kind of guy. Mm. You know, I'm I'm if I am armed, if I've got the right team behind me and you just point me, I am on. But yeah. When it comes to following checklists and and or, or biggest challenge I've found in coming into a team of from from two people where you just just you and them and you know everything that's going on to a team of 21 got to make sure anyone can find out what's happening with that file at any time and there's a level mm-hmm. of discipline in that that you know i'm more like a labrador i'm just running around chasing tennis balls in the backyard um mm. but if i'm if they throw the tennis ball in the right way i'm on you know and it's finding those complementary positions and you know i think that's it's a mm. I, I think that's the consolidation of our industry you know to the flip side there's probably great advisors out there who aren't into acquiring new business but are really good at taking care of existing clients or really Mm. good at managing advisors or where they've been forced into advice roles because that's where money was we might see that that consolidation over the next few years totally and i think it's good people should play to their strengths i think that makes businesses stronger i think it makes advice stronger so it's great to see and uh, i feel like i need to call out that you talk about yourself being a labrador chasing the dog around uh, the ball around the backyard but yet you've built a uh, a SaaS portfolio construction um uh, business so maybe maybe that's not uh, 100% accurate but anyway i'm keen to unpack that in a little bit more detail but um just to close out on on that transition piece how are you actually finding it now you're about 8 or so months into you know joining that business um how are you finding that transition you know, what have been the learnings for you so far? I think, you know, key and for anyone considering this kind of moves, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, I think, you know, Ryan and I were really excited. Let's get started. Let's get on with it. And it's taken, you know, six months before I'm finally doing things in the systematic way. And, you know, I mean, I've been been able to, you know, to my strengths, write new business and bring on clients and, and take care of existing clients and that. But 
you know, I think it does take time and you've got to be patient. There's got to be cultural alignment. You've got to be wanting the same thing. You've got to communicate well. You know, I think that's been really important. You know, things that we've been doing well in that space is being patient with each other, communicate well, keep everything open and honest, catch up regularly. You know, that's been the big part of that. And and I think understanding each other. You know, they they know that I'm the Labrador. You know, Ryan's um, you know very direct and down the line and but focused and driven. So we play to each other's strengths. And and there's other members of the team that you, and you know I think understanding those dynamics of other members of the team and working together works really well. So that's what I'd be. You know, when you're looking at a similar position, don't just look at the the numbers on the table and what could be done if it was you doing it. Look at how that interaction would happen. Because I think, again, strengths or weaknesses play to those. Don't get beaten by what you know. Yeah, totally. Team fit, all important, I think, in any role. But particularly for that, if you're, especially you, I think if you're used to running your own show, that you need to find someone that you can, I think, communicate well with. Um, you know, people start businesses generally because, part of it is that they don't want to be told what to do so you and then you join a business you need to be told what to do so it's you you want someone that can deliver that message in the right way that's um yeah going to be conducive to getting to where you need to be changing tack a little bit tell us a, a bit about the um ethos australia you know i think the last time that you were on the xy podcast that was only basically it just sort of kicked off so um for people that don't know, where has it come from? How has it been? What it, where are things at, and, and what are you finding at the moment? It's um, well, we're really, really hitting our stride. So it, it started actually in the United States. Um, the founder in Minneapolis tried to build a tennis app, um, couldn't really get it across the line. Went to invest some money, couldn't figure out how to invest it in line with his values, and found a hole in the market. Um, we've been working with him now to really develop the financial advice side of that. It did start as a retail product. Um, so financial advice side, we've developed out, you know, the, the investment consultant and SMA side. So a number of investment consultants and SMA providers are using it in the back end of their of the portfolios. Um, we're talking to fund managers using it for distribution now. And so it's really growing. But the the goal for the next 12 months for us is to get as many financial advisors on the platform as we can. Um, there's a free version of the platform. There's a paid version of the platform and there's training and coaching programs we're going to be rolling out to enhance that value proposition. We just want people using it because the basic idea is if you're not a specialist going through PDS documents like I do when I'm looking at investments, you can still do really good quality ethical investment advice. You jump on the platform, you use the questionnaire with the client, go through and open that up, you know, what are the things you care most about? And within those things, what's more important, you know, between, you know, resource allocation and, and climate change and ranking and you follow the, the prompts and it develops a, a persona, an impact persona for that person. And then that persona applies to the investments you start looking at. You're in Australian super, you know, how aligned is it? Okay, it's 65% aligned to you. What if we flipped it into their socially aware option? Okay, that's 75% aligned to you. But, you know, their, their partner might be 80% aligned because they care about different things and the different, you know, the investments will be good in some areas and not as good in others. The example mm. I always use is, is Tesla, if you care about climate change and innovation, but nothing else, Tesla's a great investment. If you care yeah. about labor rights, not so good. So, you know, that I think that personalization piece really comes in. And from a best interest perspective, you've now gone, well, what do you care about? What's important to you from the code's perspective, standard two? Then you've gone, okay, looking at the options. So there's there's your IG requirements and your, and your BID requirements. And then you're going, okay, standard five, what about product options? And then you can go away and either put together a portfolio or compare some SMAs or compare pro portfolios, report on it and go back to the client and say, look, here are three or four options. They're quantifiably either better or worse for your causes, what you care about most. Here's some performance. Here's some asset allocation. Here's some other considerations in pricing. What do you think? And they go, I want the more ethical one. I'm happy to pay more. Or actually, I don't. I want this one. Or, you know, it builds in to the advice process because it was helped develop by an advisor from Australia who knows the advice process. So it's been built around that. And the idea is that you can roll that out in five minutes with a client and have a really good backed up solution with as much or as little detail as you want for the client um, in an easy way. That's it's We're just trying to make ethical investment advice easy because then everyone will do it. And if every mm. advisor in the country did 10% more ethical investment advice, I think I've done my bit for the planet. Totally. Yeah. And it's not easy. Like it's difficult to, to figure out what the, you know, what makes sense, how to get that alignment. Uh, everyone's preferences are different as well. So it ends up being bespoke. But 
Um, yeah, I wonder with that Tesla thing, is it just because he's making everybody work from the office for 40 hours a week? Is that where the labor uh, rights thing is coming from? Or it's purely, yeah, it's purely the, it's purely that it does nothing to do with, you know, workplace <laughs> breaches and health and safety and all the rest of it. It's just because no one wants to go back to the office. Yeah. And he's <laughs> tweeting too much, you know, it's, it's, it's the... mate, you clearly, you know, become a, an expert in this particular space. So I'm wondering, like, how have you gone about building your your knowledge in the ESG space over time? And how do you learn, uh, you know, in, in that changing landscape for yourself? Um, it's There's a couple of, I suppose, different areas. I think an understanding come from interest, I think, is the first one. So for me, climate change is a, is a big thing. I'm... I'm, I'm into climate change, you know. I, so it's something I like, I enjoy reading about. Um, but then I connected on LinkedIn with a bunch of professionals in this space. So like I'm listening this morning to the ABC radio and Tim Buckley gets on and Tim Buckley is this just absolute legend in energy. And he just starts talking to the ABC about this, like the the um, gas export market in Australia and why we're in this energy crisis situation and how we need to transition to renewables. And I listen to that stuff all day. Um, so I think that that interest piece comes in and I've connected with Tim and I follow him and I think, you know, talking to people that you're in an area you're interested in is really important, whether that's healthcare, whether that's technology, you know, that's the same as anything else. Um, but then expanding outside of that, you know, I've done, um, Alexandra Brown's, um, invest with ethics course, which I'd highly recommend, um, everyone who wants to get more involved in this, go down that path. It's a really, really good entry level course. And then like anything, talking to fund managers, engaging with, you know, I, I think people love talking about things they're passionate about and people mm. in the sustainable and ethical investment space love it even more. You know, if you bring a normal fund and you say, I want to talk to the PM, there's no way you'll get through. If you bring an ethical investment fund and say, I want to talk to the PM about, you know, you bring Osbill and say, I want to talk to Mons about modern slavery. He'll talk to you for two hours, <laughs> just, yeah. just like that, because he cares about it, because he's passionate about it, because he's flying to Southeast Asia to go to these, you know, these manufacturing facilities and see if what they're reporting is true. You know, so I think, yeah, that, that level of interest, you can play to people's passion. Um, and you, through that, you can osmotically absorb it. So, yeah, you've got to be interested in it. Um, and then and then the old, the good old-fashioned tax outside of that. I think, um, you yeah, know, more broadly than that, I, I'd love to see more education from conferences and things like that. I think that's an area that we're not doing really well at. There's been a couple that I've seen or been to lately where uh, they just missed the mark. There's greenwashing. There's There's... There's, there's purchased spaces, you know, that the, the key sponsor shouldn't necessarily be on there. You know, there's a newspaper that's hosting an ESG summit where the CEO of Whitehaven Coal is speaking. Like you yeah. shouldn't even get a seat at the table in that conference. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of stuff I think is really hard because that's, you know, when you go to those conferences and you start hearing the message from 10 years ago, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And you you know, you walk out of that and you ring your mate who's in northern New South Wales and go, yeah, how's your house? Oh, you're not too bad. I just have to get the dinghy to go and, you know, see the damage. But yeah. yeah. What's the price of lettuce at the moment? Why is that happening? You know, like $12 lettuce, climate change. No one wants cabbage on their KFC burgers. I don't know if you've seen this. KFC. I did, yeah. Their lettuce with that cabbage. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, you know, they've stomped on their own lettuce supply. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because they can't get this. I'm not a big fan of lettuce, though, generally. Like, some of them are okay, but the cabbage, I was thinking about it. And, like, you know, pretty crisp. It's, uh, I don't know. It's worth, a, it's worth a try. But I get the point that we, if we want to have lettuce, we should be able to have lettuce. We should be able yeah. to have lettuce, definitely. Yeah, and if you want to have power and heating during cold for Melbourne months that we're having at the moment, which I'm loving, mind you, um, <laughs> you know, not have power issues. We need to have you know, supply of power. And if we're exporting gas off to, you know, other parts of the world over doing it, you know, for, for domestic use. And, you know, I could go about that all day. The point is interest and passion, I think, and oh. probably, you know, a bit of golden retriever energy again. Um, where I was just going to say, where, where should advisors start? Cause I think that it, ESG is impossible to ignore at the moment, but there is a lot of confusion out there. You know, advisors are pretty stretched as it is with your post-COVID world and just all the things that uh, are on our plates. What would be the best way for someone that's that knows that it's important, that has a broad sort of alignment to it on a on a values perspective, but isn't deep, you know, into it? What? Well, how should they go about learning? This is actually a problem that I'm trying to help solve at the moment. So one of the biggest challenges I'm finding from chatting to advisors is as soon as they start 
learning about it. And then they start seeing me talk about gas exports and, and they feel like it's this massive rabbit hole. Like I cannot possibly learn this. What if my client asks me about this issue? What if they ask me about this issue? If they care about that, how can I respond? Mm. And that's extremely, you know, confronting. Um, and it's a bit of imposter syndrome. I don't know if I can talk to someone about something if I don't understand it. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I've been, we just finished our first pilot run of a, of a, what we're calling our, our Kickstarter program. We're just running through ethos. Um, we'll be running for a number of licensees next financial year. Um, but if anyone wants to get on board with them, we can just throw you into those programs. And the idea is baby steps, start having the conversation, just ask the client what they care about and then leave the conversation. You don't have to answer it. You don't go into solution mode and then go away and do a little bit of research on that. You know, call me, you know, ring, ring a fund manager, use ethos. Um, and the, you know, for the program, we then go back into, okay, well have that conversation go, what worked, what didn't next week. This is how you research. Cool. How the research go, what worked, what didn't next week. Here's how you present it back to the client. You know, and we use other tools outside of our own as well. We use a broad range of tools there. Okay, what worked, what didn't. And last week, overall, what worked, what didn't. What are we going to do from here? And I think by doing little steps, breaking it up into bite-sized pieces, um, it's not as scary as we might think in our heads. We don't need to be the expert on every area of sustainability and ethical investing to answer a client's preference. Because most clients mm. just want it to be better. And I think we put this perfection instead of progress hat on where you know clients just want to use a you know a bamboo toothbrush even though it comes in plastic packaging instead of <laughs> a toothbrush that biodegrades and then regenerates into a new toothbrush or something you know that's, that's the image we have in our head it turns into an uh, you know mustard tree or something like that <laughs> that's right you, yeah so you plant you plant it when it's done and then you can pick your toothbrushes off the tree later or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I, it's funny as you say that, it, it made me have the thought and um, I know I've fallen into this trap before, but when someone, like we know that with financial advice strategy and technical strategy that we don't have to be able to answer all the questions in the room. But I know that I've fallen into the, the trap of thinking like, oh, well, if I start going down this path, then I need to be able to do all of that. It's like you don't think about it necessarily in the same way that um that makes a lot of sense that yes you can just ask questions and say okay well yes you know esg is a super technical area so we're going to need to go away and do some thinking do some research then we can come and and talk about it and i think you know as you say most investors are on that journey they're probably not going to be a major issue that we're on the journey with them and in fact i suppose that that you know um that is something that they might get behind even more as well with you know going through that process at at Tribeca, we are coming on board and helping develop the ESG solution. And one of the scary things is we got you know talked to each of the advisor in a in a room and went, if we marketed internally right now and said we we could be talking about this to everyone, what's the uptake? And everyone we worked up at ninety ninety five percent of the clients. Mm. You know the fir the first client that I went into a joint meeting with was a client who hadn't had an ethical investment conversation. But the advisor. Had it's one of the biggest clients of the firm. The advisor said, I reckon they're going to want it. Notes said things like, you know, the wife doesn't engage. She's not all that interested. Um, generally, most of it's with, you know, with the husband, blah, blah, blah. We started talking about climate change and politics on that side of the spectrum. She led up. We've engaged with them. They've sent us five referrals. Yeah. And this is one of our wealthiest clients. Like the it, it's something other to talk about than rising interest rates and inflation as well. You know, mm. it adds a whole spectrum to your conversation of, yeah, Interest, fixed interest may not be doing great right now, but you know what is great? The fact that your money has gone towards this halfway house of 55 to 65-year-old women who are escaping domestic violence. That's pretty cool. Mm. You know, it takes away from just the up and down of markets. Love it. And it's something that I can see how people get behind in terms of talking about it with their mates and, you know, opening up those conversations, which I think is good for advice, but obviously, you know, commercially good and that could drive referrals and that sort of stuff as well. Nate, I could honestly talk about that all day, but um, and I know that you could too, but I won't. Um, my, my last uh, big question for you is that you obviously you've been an advisor for um, you know quite a while. If you could go back to, uh, I forget exactly what you called it, but um, fresh faced little Nathan, you know, walking in um, uh, to the big bank way back when, what would be your one piece of advice, or what would you do differently? 
I, I think I did a lot of things really well. Like I was flat fee from day dot. I backed myself well. I, you know, I focused on strategy over product, even at the bank, things like that. I would still want to do, but, and, and I, I, I love what I learned at the bank, but I would have said, go independent and go fast, like get out there and start doing it, break the mold, challenge the status quo, be brave, do it the right way f- from now, you know, um, if I'd never, I mean, personally, if I could start a business again, I wouldn't take insurance commissions. I charge fee for advice by the hour, calculated, like that's how I would do it again. Um, mm. But it takes an enormous amount of confidence to do that and it takes time to build that confidence. So, um, mm. and I think that's where our industry is going to go. Uh, I look at the other professions and I look at those things. And I look at some of the young people coming through, some of the associates I've met, you know, and it's, you know, the, a couple of things I've seen at Strive, unreal talent coming through. If mm. we as an advice community can support them, which is our challenge, is how do we bring through, you know, new advisors? Um, mm. Yeah, I'd be brave. That's what I'd say. I think it also takes a bit of time to learn some of those lessons as well that I know for me, and we have been flat fee from day dot. We have done no com from day dot as well, but we did fun fee for a bit. And then, I, t- you know, it takes you a while that you go, oh, that's not there. And then there's so many other things that happen as well that sometimes experience is that teacher and you need to learn the lesson to realize what didn't work in quite the way that you wanted it to so that you know what to tweak and, and refine from there. Nathan, thank you so much for, for sharing your insights. For people that are keen to learn more about uh, Ethos Australia or what you guys are about, what should they know and uh, where should they go? Um, email me. Nathan at ethosesg.com or LinkedIn, as always. Message me on XY. I try. I log in pretty much every day, so I try and reply as soon as I can. Um, or nathan.fradley at trabecafinancial.com.au as well. More than happy to, to help out along the way, point you in the right direction, introduce you to the right people, whatever you need. I'm, um, yeah, I'd love to see that area of, of the market develop. Awesome, mate. Well, thank you again for sharing your story and uh, yeah, look forward to chatting on the next one. Thanks, man.